Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guest today is Sarah Hahn, Associate Professor of Law at Washington Lee University School of Law. We'll be discussing her recent article, Civil Rights and Shareholder Activism, SEC versus Medical Committee for Human Rights, which is forthcoming in the Washington Lee Law Review. I'll link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. Sarah, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you, Andrew. Before we start talking about some of the the content of this paper, I wonder if you could uh, discuss what motivated you to write this article and how did you go about doing the research to write? It looks like there was a decent amount of archival work uh, in the process. So I have been intrigued by this case for a long time. I think it was when I first learned that the shareholder proponent in uh, SEC v. Medical Committee for Human Rights was a civil rights organization. And that really piqued my interest. And I decided I wanted to learn more about the case. And the more that I learned about it, the the deeper I wanted to go. And, you know, as you're alluding, because this is a historical article, I, I went pretty deep. I did a fair amount of archival research and just kept going. In fact, um, I'm embarrassed to say that as this article was going to publication, I was still generating new content from documents and things I was I was coming across. Among other things, I looked at the individual papers of the Supreme Court justices who decided the case, you know, going to archives at Yale and the Library of Congress. Medical Committee for Human Rights has an archive of their papers. The organization sort of went out of business by the end of the 1970s, and they They've deposited their papers, so I looked at those. We here at Washington and Lee, we have the Powell archives, and even though Lewis Powell didn't participate in the case when it was before the Supreme Court, I did research in the Powell archives related to his famous uh, 1971 Powell Memorandum, which was based on a 1970 speech that he gave. And I was looking also to see if he was, you know, he was nominated for the Supreme Court while this case was being considered by the Supreme Court. So I looked at that. I looked at the papers of William J. Casey, who is the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission from 1971 to 73. Those papers are at your institution, the Hoover Institute at Stanford. And I actually even did some interviews. I interviewed Dr. Uh, Theodore Tapper, who was a pediatrician and a member of medical committee who presented the NAPALM proposal on behalf of medical committee in 1969 and 1971 at Dow's annual meetings. And side note, which is not in the article, Dr. Theodore Tapper is the father of Jake Tapper, the CNN correspondent. And Harvey Pitt, who of course was the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission starting in 2001, he actually participated as a very junior SEC lawyer in this litigation. I spoke to him and he participated in the symposium that we held at Washington and Lee Law School. Uh, He came to Lexington and participated in that. So I got some insights from him as well. So I was very surprised to learn that just finding the underlying documents, the uh, the very old proxy statements of the Dow Chemical Company were really, that was really challenging. Um, The SEC doesn't make them easy to find, even though they were all filed with the SEC back in the day. So a a lot of work and archival research, yes. Yep, there was no no Edgar to turn to in the 1970s. Uh, one of the things that really picked my interest in this article was the civil rights and shareholder activism intersection. And before we talk about some of the history of the medical committee case, I wonder if you could give some background on some of the civil rights roots of shareholder activism, maybe as a predecessor to the case that we'll focus on today. Why did civil rights activists turn at least partly from litigation strategies or from public policy strategies to uh, shareholder activism? Yeah, this was an aspect of shareholder activism that I didn't know much about when I started this research. And I, I think it's it hasn't really received the attention that it deserves. A bunch of early, what we would now call ESG shareholder activism was really generated by civil rights activists starting, believe it or not, in the late 1940s. In particular, there was an activist named James Peck, 
who was a freedom rider. He's a famous civil rights activist who in the late 1940s sort of pioneered this technique where he, as a member of Congress, the Congress of Racial Equality Corps, he and other core members would buy shares of stock. They started with the Greyhound Bus Company, and then they tried to use that stock to get the Greyhound Bus Company to desegregate its bus routes. And later he used the same technique at variety store companies like Woolworths and Grants and Cresses to try to get them to desegregate their lunch counters. And this was really before the bus boycotts and before the lunch counter sit-ins. And he had a little bit of success, but mostly he was unsuccessful at that. But it built interest on the part of civil rights organizations in pursuing shareholder activism. I think the other thing going on at this time as in the 1950s and 60s was that when we think of the civil rights movement, we often think of all the litigation that was going on and then yielded some important successes like Brown versus Board of Education. But, but back at the time, those, those court wins did not result in immediate desegregation of the schools, immediate really on the ground change. And so I certainly, in my research, found evidence that suggested that civil rights activists wanted, they were looking for alternatives to litigation, and that activists like James Peck and others settled on shareholder activism or thought that it it had some potential. And so that's, I think, where you start to see some of this. And it seemed to have picked up in 1967 when Saul Alinsky, who was a big community organizer, he organized this big campaign at the uh, Eastman Kodak Company in Rochester and had a lot of success with that campaign related to the company's Kodak racial employment policies. And it just sort of picked up steam from there, then moving on to 1968 with Medical Committee. So I think that's great background. And that takes us to uh, the key history of of this paper. And you you really go in depth uh, in the paper into the Medical Committee's campaign to get Dow Chemical to stop manufacturing napalm. But I wonder if you could sketch that history out a little bit for the listeners. What was the role of the Medical Committee? Who were the Medical Committee? I thought this was kind of an interesting uh, legal academia connection. Where did they get the shares that they used to, to wage this campaign? It is such an interesting story. So Medical Committee formed in the 1960s as sort of the medical arm of the civil rights movement. And they came to prominence in the Freedom Summer of 1964. So they were best known for sending doctors, medical students, and nurses, and other kinds of health practitioners to civil rights protests and marches. And in fact, uh, Quentin Young, who is the head of medical committee for some of the time that I cover in this article, he was a Chicago physician who had personally provided medical assistance to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Chicago when Dr. King was hit in the head by a rock during a protest there. So they were sort of known for that, but they did a lot of other things as well, including protesting the American Medical Association, which was a racist organization at the time, and was keeping black doctors out. They were a big proponent of Medicaid and helping low-income people get access to medical care. And they operated clinics for low-income men facing the draft during the Vietnam War. They eventually sort of shifted over to a sort of peace stance and an anti-war activism, which was the trend at the end of the, the 1960s with a lot of civil rights organizations. In 1968, Medical Committee received a donation of five shares of Dow Chemical Company stock from Jeffrey Cowan, who was a, then a Yale law student. And so I'm kind of proud that I included this in the article. This is straight from the archives of Medical Committee, heretofore unknown piece of information that Jeffrey Cowan was the source of the stock. And Within just a few weeks of the donation, a medical committee was communicating with Dow to say, essentially, (laughs) we would like you to stop manufacturing napalm. We're an owner of the company. We think, you know, we want to talk to the other owners of the company about this. We think they'll agree with us. So a a couple of words about Dow. I mean, uh, back then in the 1960s, Dow was one of the biggest companies in the United States. They started manufacturing napalm in 1965 or 1966. And by 1968, they were really the only American manufacturer of napalm. It was controversial for the company from the beginning. It was in all the newspapers. And Dow experienced a lot of protests as a result. 
From 1966 to 1970, Dow's board chair estimated that they experienced more than 200 protests. Uh, One really big one took place in 1967. That was at the University of Wisconsin when students protested a Dow recruiter who'd come to their campus. And the protest turned into an enormous riot that injured 65 people and was the first time in American history that tear gas was used on an American university campus. And overseas, Dow's offices were physically bombed. So from the beginning, this was a lightning rod for Dow. And when they received this letter from Medical Committee in 1968, they put Medical Committee off. The Medical Committee had missed the deadline for the 1968 proxy statement. One of the things that you see in this story is how important all of these little petty bureaucratic aspects of Rule 14A8 turn out to be when you've got a sort of civil rights shareholder that's not sophisticated about the securities laws trying to express its voice. So they were defeated in 1968 because they missed the deadline. And in 1969, they resubmitted. They were much savvier in 1969, there's evidence that they got advice from a securities lawyer. They resubmitted the same proposal. And because they succeeded in making the deadline, Dow had to go to the SEC to request a no action letter. And the SEC granted Dow a no action letter. But because medical committee was sophisticated here, because they had the advice of a lawyer, they knew to ask the full commission to consider the no action letter, which was a decision of the Division of Corporation Finance. And so then the SEC, the full commission, considered the no action letter and and actually approved the no action letter. But then that formed the basis of medical committee's legal appeal. So medical committee sought judicial review of the commission's decision affirming the no action letter. And that was what kicked off all of the the litigation in this case. How did this campaign between the medical committee and and Dow fit into the broader proxy seasons that we saw around this time? It it seemed, uh, when I was reading the paper, it seemed far more tumultuous and, and dramatic than we might be accustomed to today, even when we've got hot button issues coming up. Yeah, you know, this aspect of the story has elicited some surprise from other people in the Corporate Law Academy when they're talking to me about this case. People haven't heard of this. And of course, 2020 is the 50th anniversary of the 1970 proxy season. There's no question that the 1970 proxy season was the most tumultuous in American history. There's really been nothing like it since then. What was going on was that activists had settled on the corporate annual meeting as a focal point for expressing activism, both outside annual meetings, so with protesters who were not shareholders picketing annual meetings and expressing dissatisfaction with a variety of corporate policies, environmental policies, racial policies, gender policies, and of course, all the munitions and war-related stuff and even other things, but also inside the meetings, shareholders and proxy holders were very active in 1970 on the floor of these meetings, speaking, challenging corporate managers and making speeches, showing photographs. They came in with loudspeakers. I mean, really interesting stuff. So just to give you some flavor for what it was like. So at General Electric's annual stockholders meeting in 1970, there was a shouting match on the floor of the meeting. They had to shut the meeting down in Connecticut. Proxy holders inside the annual meeting of United Aircraft Corp were actually arrested and taken outside the building, which was heavily guarded. This was very consistent, I think, at a lot of these big company meetings. The corporate management paid private security and had private security and plainclothes police present and guard dogs often. San Francisco at the annual meeting of CBS They had to suspend the meeting, stop it in the middle, so that they could clear the building of nine Women's Liberation Front activists who had come in to protest the company's treatment of women. This is CBS, the company that would go on to have Les Moonves as their chair (laughs) years later. At Commonwealth Edison, there was an anti-pollution resolution made by a group calling itself the Committee Against Pollution from the the meeting floor at Olin Corp. I actually kind of like the story here about 
Olin Corp because nothing happened at the Olin Corp meeting, except that shareholders who, who attended the meeting found themselves facing 28 armed off-duty police officers, 15 private security guards, and a Doberman pincher. And nobody protested anything at the annual meeting, but the shareholders were actually quite upset because of the overkill of the security measures. And then, of course, at Honeywell, so the the big story in 1970 was the Honeywell annual meeting, which had to be ended after 14 minutes because the chairman thought that it was going to devolve into violence. And then 1970 was also the year that campaign GM took off at General Motors, led by Ralph Nader. And so really, so there was just a ton of uh, activism and even violence at some of these meetings. And so you can imagine what the headlines look like. And this is a period of, of several months. So, you know, starting in maybe March and going up through the beginning of June of 1970. So against the, the backdrop of that tumultuous 1970 proxy season, we have SEC versus Medical Committee. As you mentioned, the Medical Committee was savvy and that they got a final agency action, uh, which allowed them to seek judicial review. What happened in that case at the D.C. Circuit? Following this incredibly tumultuous proxy season, I think that medical committee's lawyers must have figured that everything was lost, right? I mean, they were litigating this case in front of the D.C. Circuit. But much to everyone's surprise, in July of 1970, so just a few weeks after the close of this crazy proxy season, a unanimous three-judge panel of the D.C. Circuit uh, decides the case in favor of medical committee. What they were deciding essentially was an administrative law issue, first that the commission's decision was reviewable, and then there was sort of a secondary issue in the case, the one that I think is much more interesting, but is a little bit more oblique as it's presented in the case, which was whether Dow should have been forced to, to put the napalm proposal in its proxy and, and bring it to a full shareholder vote. And so there's a lot of interesting stuff about this D.C. Circuit uh, opinion. First of all, it was authored by a judge named Edward Allen Tam, who was himself this sort of fascinating figure. I buried some of this in a footnote in the article, but Edward Allen Tam, so notwithstanding the fact that he and the other judges came out robustly in favor of corporate democracy. He was a conservative judge. And in fact, he had spent many years at the FBI as an FBI agent and rose to the level of J. Edgar Hoover's right-hand man. Actually, he played a leading role in some of the most celebrated FBI cases of that era. He was the supervisor of the Lindbergh kidnapping case. He supervised the capture of John Dillinger, and then went on to become a judge on the D.C. Circuit, where he was extremely highly regarded. And as I explain in, the, in my article, about five years after he writes the opinion in medical committee, he wrote a dissent in the D.C. Circuit opinion in Buckley v. Vallejo. So the D.C. Circuit decided Buckley v. Vallejo. It went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court overturned the D.C. Circuit opinion. But in doing that, they essentially endorsed Judge Tam's opinion. And so it was Judge Tam who kind of pioneered the idea that money is speech, the idea that comes out in Buckley v. Vallejo, and the idea that there is this important First Amendment distinction between expenditures and contributions. So Judge Tam, I think we have to understand when we talk about the D.C. Circuit opinion, Judge Tam was a very influential thinker, very highly regarded, smart, smart jurist. And so in the opinion that he writes in medical committee, he says, uh, you know, some things worth noting, like it is obvious to the point of banality that Congress intended by its enactment of Section 14 of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 to give true vitality to the concept of corporate democracy. And that was an important thing when he wrote that, because that was the first time the D.C. Circuit had ever talked about corporate democracy. And here he is saying it's really obvious that Congress wants corporate democracy to be this really vital robust thing. And then he decided that this was all reviewable and kind of kicks it back down to the SEC. But in doing that, he's really critical of the SEC's resolution that the proposal didn't need to be in Dow's proxy statement and criticizes the SEC for advancing, quote, no reason why management may properly place obstacles in the path of shareholders who wish to present to their co-owners in accord with applicable state law the question of whether they wish to have their assets used in a manner which they believe to be more socially responsible, but possibly less profitable 
than that which is dictated by present company policy. I mean, he put his finger on the pulse of this issue that we're still dealing with today, right? Whether shareholders have a right to decide for themselves, separate and apart from corporate management, that the company should make a little less money in order to vindicate some social or political or environmental principle. And he, Judge Tam, and and the other two judges unanimously were saying, you know, this is what corporate democracy looks like it means to us. And SEC, if you think differently, you're really going to have to justify that. And then what happened at the Supreme Court? Unfortunately, the case fizzles at the Supreme Court. So you can sort of see where this is going because it looks like it's set up to be a really important Supreme Court case. And the SEC seeks a cert petition here, tries to cabinet narrowly to the administrative law issue. The Supreme Court grants cert. Meanwhile, Dow reads the writing on the wall, you know, reads this DC Circuit opinion and decides to let the NAPALM proposal go to a vote. So the NAPALM proposal is actually presented at its 1971 annual meeting, presented by Theodore Tapper. What's crazy is that after asking the Supreme Court to take this case at the absolute 11th hour in a reply brief right just days before oral argument in fall of 1971, the SEC completely changes course and suddenly argues to the Supreme Court that it should no longer decide this case and that the case is actually moot. And it points back at this 1971 annual shareholders meeting where the NAPOM proposal went to a vote and says that is the reason why the case has now become moot. Medical Committee's lawyer, who was a Covington and Burling partner, is essentially blindsided by this argument that the case is now moot at oral argument. And he dismisses it. But it's clear, you know, when you review the justices' papers, that they were persuaded of this mootness argument almost from the get-go. And he's eventually allowed, his name is Roberts Owen uh, at Covington and Burling. Roberts Owen is eventually asked to submit a brief on the mootness issue. And he does, he submits a brief, but it was essentially after the justices had already decided that the case was moot. And the opinion is written by Justice Thurgood Marshall. I should say also that one really interesting aspect of this case is that by the time the case is decided, there are no longer nine justices sitting on the court. Two of them have dropped off. So Hugo Black and John Marshall Harlan both had health crises before the case was argued and dropped off the court and their replacements had not yet been seated. Their replacements would be Justice Rehnquist and Justice Lewis Powell, but neither of them played a role in the case. So there are actually two vacancies on the court when all of this happens. So the decision that this is a a moot case is made by seven justices. And um, as I explained in the article, what's really interesting when you look back at their the justices' papers, it would have been a close case on the merits. Now, of course, what they're primarily deciding is the administrative law issue. Well, what they would have decided, they decided nothing because they concluded that the case was moot. But primarily, it was an administrative law case. But then, of course, hiding behind that was this really substantive issue about what corporate democracy means. And it looks to me, based on my reading, like Justices Marshall, Douglas, and Brennan would have sided with medical committee, if, you know, I'm kind of reading the tea leaves here, so I have to be careful when I say that. But there's there are indications in the papers that they were favorably inclined toward Judge Tam's take, robust take on corporate democracy. But it, it all comes to nothing because in the end, Justice Marshall writes an opinion saying the case is moot. Justice Douglas dissents, and this is potentially significant because Justice Douglas was the only justice of the Supreme Court, who had real substantive securities law experience. He had served as the chair of the United States Securities and Exchange Commission much earlier in his career. And in his dissent, he writes a passage that could have been written today. He wrote, quote, the modern super corporations of which Dow is one wield immense, virtually unchecked power. Some say they are private governments whose decisions affect the lives of us all. The philosophy of our times, I think, requires that such enterprises be held to a higher standard than that of the morals of the marketplace, which exalts a single-minded, myopic determination to maximize profits. And so, you know, here we are in 2019 talking about 
shareholder wealth maximization and stakeholder interests. And he's essentially raising these things in his dissent. Justice Douglas was quite prescient. He also argued, of course, that the issues that were coming up in this case relating to Rule 1488, they were not likely to go away. And he was right about that as well. But in the end, you know, because they moot the case, this vacates the D.C. Circuit Court opinion. And so really any gains that medical committee had won in the D.C. Circuit evaporate. And that's sort of how this story ends. Medical committee, I found evidence in their archives to suggest that they tried to submit their napalm proposal again to Dow's next annual meeting. But they had a problem, which is that when they submitted it in 1971, it didn't garner enough votes to pass the resubmission threshold. And they tried to argue about that. But Dow excluded their proposal and excluded another proposal, probably with the SEC's approval, although I couldn't find evidence of that. And the rest, as they say, is history. Medical Committee ceased to exist as a civil rights organization by 1980. And presumably its stock was sold off. And that's sort of the end of the story. This is a story about a case that was potentially very hot, but then it fizzled and has, as you note in the paper, receded a little bit from memory, although this article will probably help bring it more attention. And you note that Judge Tam really had his finger on the pulse of the, the current debate over shareholder democracy. I wonder if we could connect medical committee to current issues. The SEC has its proposed 14A8 amendments out. I wonder if we could connect that to some of the current debate about corporate democracy and and shareholder activism. Yeah, I mean, I'm super interested in all of this. I I should say that I'm on sabbatical now writing a book about corporate democracy. So this is this case has only whetted my appetite for thinking about and theorizing about corporate democracy. What did people think it meant back then? What could it mean? (laughs) What is the promise of corporate democracy? And I think certainly seen, you know, this fall, um, lots of issues that intersect with things that were relevant to the medical committee case back in the 1970s coming up. I wrote a short piece about this article in the Harvard Forum on Corporate Governance. And in particular, I highlighted Facebook. Facebook has had a lot of controversy recently around their political ads policy. And I was really interested to see that Facebook's COO, Sheryl Sandberg, went on the record and said that Facebook, essentially, they weren't making much money from that political ads weren't very profitable for Facebook, and that all the controversy that political ads were generating, there were more controversy than it was worth to the company. But she emphasized, you know, Facebook is committed to free speech. And so it's really the principle of the thing that is causing Facebook to continue to allow political ads. And when I heard her say that, I mean, it just brought me back immediately to Carl Gerstacker, who was the board chair of the Dow Chemical Company back in the day. He said essentially the same thing. Dow did not earn very much money by producing napalm. Dow was an enormous company. It was best known at the time for making styrofoam and saran wrap. Those were some of its major products. And so, you know, their offices were being bombed. You know, they couldn't recruit any new employees on college campuses as a result of all this controversy. So for Dow, too, it was like the controversy was, there was more controversy than the napalm profits were worth. And yet Gerstacker and Dow's board contended that they had to keep producing napalm on principle. It was a sort of a moral principle that they should stand with the United States government and provide it with napalm. And as we know, and I haven't said this yet in the call, but I talk about this in the article, in fact, Dow quietly stopped manufacturing napalm very shortly after medical committee started agitating about it as a shareholder. So we know that medical committee submitted its first letter to Dow in 1968, and then they had their 1968 annual meeting. By the 1969 annual meeting, it looks like Dow was no longer producing napalm. So even though they continued to maintain they had the right to make napalm, and they never conceded that they had knuckled under to the shareholder pressure, Dow, in fact, did stop making napalm. And so a similar situation arose with Walmart. People might be more familiar with the Walmart case involving assault rifles. 
So a few years back, Trinity Wall Street, a, a church and a shareholder in Walmart, asked Walmart to stop selling assault rifles. And Walmart fought that all the way to the Third Circuit and won in litigation. But soon after winning the litigation, they quietly stopped selling assault rifles. And then, of course, this year, Walmart had a terrible mass shooting at one of their stores. And then they further stopped selling ammunition and they stopped the practice of open carry in their stores. And so, you know, they sort of, well, I guess you would say in that case that their shareholder, Trinity Wall Street, lost, but also still won. And so when I hear Facebook say something like, oh, you know, this is more trouble than it's worth, but we're going to keep doing it on principle, I think, sure you will. (laughs) Because that's not what Walmart did, and that's not what Dow Chemical Company did. But I would like to talk a little bit about the SEC's proposed amendments to Rule 14A8, because that's something that's going on right now that connects directly to the medical committee case. And I think people should really be paying attention to this. At the beginning of November, the SEC proposed some changes to the shareholder proposal rule, which is Rule 14A8, that would essentially diminish shareholder voice and limit or impair what I'm calling corporate democracy, right? The ability of shareholders to express themselves and to hold management accountable to what shareholders want, right? And it's not just me saying that's what corporate democracy is. That's also what Judge Tam and the unanimous three-judge panel of the D.C. Circuit seem to think it was, and some of the Supreme Court justices seem to be uh, inclined toward that view as well. And so the proposed amendments to Rule 14A8 The SEC has some other proposed amendments that relate to proxy advisors, but let's put those to the side for now. But what the SEC is suggesting is changing shareholder eligibility requirements to make it harder for small shareholders to be eligible to bring a shareholder proposal in the first place. So that would be any kind of proposal, not just a social or political or environmental proposal, but you know, even a governance proposal. So they, they're they proposing to amend the eligibility rules and then also the resubmission thresholds. They want to change the resubmission thresholds to make it harder for shareholders to resubmit proposals in successive years. And of course, that was a problem for medical committee as well. In fact, as I was just explaining earlier, it was because when the medical committee NAPALM proposal went to a vote in 1971, and did not hit that resubmission threshold, it then, under the SEC's rules, couldn't be voted on, submitted again for three more years. And that fact was used as the basis for the Supreme Court to decide that the case was moot, right? So these resubmission thresholds, they're relevant to corporate governance practice, but they're also relevant to issues of judicial review. So it's really interesting what the SEC is doing. So at the time that medical committee engaged in its activism, there was no minimum shareholding requirement. Uh, The minimum shareholding requirement of $1,000 worth of a company's shares, that was introduced in 1983. In the years after all of this activism happened, and you saw really what I describe in the article as a backlash, there's this big backlash by business to try to suppress shareholder voice. So in 1983, they create this uh, minimum holding requirement. You have to have owned $1,000 worth of the company's stock for at least a year to bring a proposal. And then that amount is increased in 1998 to $2,000, and that's where it stands today. And what the SEC has proposed in its latest round of amendments is to increase the eligibility, the, the minimum shareholding, and they want to introduce what they call tiered thresholds. So if you've only owned a company's stock for one to just under two years, you would need $25,000 of the company's stock. If you've owned it for at least two years, $15,000. And if you've owned it for at least three years, it would be the current $2,000 level. And so it's worth noting that if these eligibility requirements had been in place in 1968, 1969, medical committee could not have engaged in its activism at all. The five shares of stock that medical committee was gifted by Mr. Cowan, I estimate that those were worth about $2,600 in 2019 dollars. So they would have needed more stock 
or they would have needed to wait until 1972 to bring their proposal. And so, you know, what I like about this is the medical committee case sort of, you know, it offers an example of how this rule change, you know, would operate in real time on the, uh, you know, on the ground. It really would have prevented medical committee's activism. And then as far as the, you know, the, the rule changes regarding resubmission thresholds, those haven't changed since 1954. The, the resubmission thresholds that are in place today are the same ones that were in place back in the 1970s when they proved to be so significant in the medical committee case. The existing resubmission thresholds say that, you know, the first time a proposal is submitted, it has to have at least uh, 3% of the vote to be submitted again the following year and 6% at year two and 10% at year three. The SEC is now proposing to really up those resubmission thresholds to 5% at the first year, 15% the second year, and 25% at the third year, three three or more years. 25% is really quite significant. I mean, it's very hard for shareholder proposals to garner 25% support. So again, you know, you see when you look back at the medical committee case, how, you know, what seem like maybe small bureaucratic changes to these arcane (laughs) SEC rules have real on the ground effect in terms of silencing shareholders, limiting voice, preventing social and environmental and political and governance, you know, regular old bread and butter governance issues from getting in front of the other shareholders and from, you know, prevent shareholders from talking to managers about all of these issues. Are there any key takeaways you'd like listeners to have from this conversation or from the paper? You know, uh, for me, I mean, again, I'm writing a book on this subject. And so what stands out to me about this case at a very high level is that we still have not decided in the United States what corporate democracy means. And I think this is really significant. You know, this case in the fall of uh, 1971, when this case was argued before the Supreme Court, it seemed like a pivotal moment when the Supreme Court was finally going to provide maybe, hopefully, some color on what corporate democracy means. And then when the Supreme Court punted on that, We've had decade after decade of uncertainty, and the contours of corporate democracy remain really contested and really sort of ambiguous. Meanwhile, of course, the United States Supreme Court has not hesitated to bring up corporate democracy in the context of corporate First Amendment rights. So if you go back to the 2010 case, Citizens United v. uh, FEC, the Supreme Court, the majority in that case, cited corporate democracy again and again as a justification for expansive corporate political speech right. You know, when you read that, it naturally causes you to wonder, well, you know, if it's important for corporations to have robust political speech rights because of corporate democracy, what is corporate democracy? We haven't really answered that question. And I think the patterns of shareholder activism over the years have shown that Shareholder activists are more sophisticated every year. They're not going away. They're pushing all kinds of environmental and social and political and governance reforms through the proposal mechanism. I actually think that, you know, notwithstanding my my opposition to these rule amendments that the SEC is proposing, I actually am not convinced that this is going to slow the roll of social and political and environmental shareholder activism. I feel like, you know, it's likely it'll probably, you know, prevent some of them. But I think that we're going to continue to see shareholder activists pressing progressive reforms in these ways. And so I guess we're, we can look forward to a day in the future when the Supreme Court does eventually consider corporate democracy and and what that means under the federal securities laws and what it means for First Amendment purposes. You know, there's a whole chapter here yet to be written. So I think that's kind of, for me, that's kind of the takeaway is, is where is this going? And I think that speaking now to the corporate law professors who are probably listening to this podcast, it's an opportunity for the Corporate Law Academy to weigh in on this and to help shape what corporate democracy is going to mean into the 21st century as it becomes maybe more and more important. 
Our guest today has been Sarah Hahn, Associate Professor of Law at Washington Lee University School of Law. We've discussed her new article, Civil Rights and Shareholder Activism, SEC versus Medical Committee for Human Rights, which is forthcoming in the Washington Lee Law Review. I'll add a link to the article in the show notes for today's episode. Sarah, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings.